paravertebral blockade is an excellent technique to provide dense surgical anesthesia or analgesia for thoracic and abdominal indications. It's been around for over 100 years, but prior to the use of ultrasound, it was always a block for experts, given the proximity to the pleura. With an ultrasound-guided technique, this block has become much more straightforward to perform, and in this video, we'll discuss the anatomy, sonoanatomy, and technique for ultrasound-guided thoracic paravertebral blockade. Paravertebral block, or PVB for short, is performed just anterior to the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebra. Here, the intercostal nerve roots emerge from the intervertebral foramina before splitting into the ventral and dorsal rami. Because of this, the PVB is a very complete block with minimal patchiness compared to other chest wall techniques. Note that local put here will get the thoracic sympathetic nerves as well, which aids greatly in treating visceral pain. Our understanding of the anatomy of this space has improved, especially with high resolution imaging techniques such as micro CT. Here's how I was taught to think of the paravertebral space. You had the vertebral body and transverse process to which the rib articulates. We'll take away the rib so that we can appreciate the anatomy beneath it. Between the ribs, we have the internal intercostal muscle, which as it runs medially, turns into a fascial barrier called the internal intercostal membrane. Finally, stretching between transverse process and rib was a superior costal transverse ligament. This last structure made up the posterior boundary of the paravertebral space, while the intervertebral foramen and the body of the vertebra made up the medial boundary and the pleura, the anterolateral boundary. The whole thing made a rough triangle, and because the intercostal nerves ran right through this, it was an attractive target. Implicit in this model was the idea that you had to place your needle anterior to the costa transverse ligament, or you'd have block failure. Makes sense. Turns out things are a little more nuanced. We still have the internal intercostal membrane and the costa transverse ligament, but the nerve rami pass both anterior and posterior to them. They do this by virtue of communicating slits that almost certainly allow for spread of local anesthetic between what is the true paravertebral space and what is called the retro superior costa transverse ligament space. That's a mouthful. We'll just call it the RS from now on. This amazing anatomical imaging study really helped push our understanding of these structures forward. In this image, imagine we as the viewer are inside the pleural cavity, looking posteriorly at the posterior chest wall. That filmy white layer is parietal pleura, and we can pull that away, revealing the internal intercostal membrane in red and the superior costal transverse ligament in blue. You can appreciate the slits in what we used to think of as barriers, that allow the nerve to travel laterally. On a parasagittal ultrasound image, we see a rector spinae muscle superficially lying over two transverse processes. Between these, we can often make out a diagonal line that is the superior costal transverse ligament, effectively dividing the space between pleura and ES muscle into two rough halves, the paravertebral space and the RS space. The RS space contains mostly loose areolar tissue and some muscle fibers. Now, the key to performing the ultrasound-guided thoracic paravertebral block is visualizing the pleura. If you can't see it, you can't be sure you're not hitting it. A parasagittal orientation with the probe allows us to see adjacent spaces, but because of the way the lung and pleura curve away from the beam, it's very difficult to see pleura looking directly deep to the transverse processes. Remember, pleura, fascia, and needles are all seen best when they're perpendicular to the beam's direction. If we just do a slight lateral tilt, then we're capturing the pleura at a far less acute angle and we'll see it better, here in the lateral aspect of the paravertebral space. Here we see the operator tilting the probe medial and lateral and the corresponding image showing TP with no pleura medially and then the rib TP junction and pleura laterally. This is where you want to put the local. Okay, so back to this picture. Note that we've labeled these as transverse processes, but with a lateral tilt, you're often catching the rib over the lateral PV space. And sometimes you can see both the rib and TP at the same time. It's all good, provided you slide your probe medially until you lose pleura and then just tilt back enough to bring it back into view. Note also that the most cephalad bit of pleura is deeper than the part in the center. That's because we've already put local anesthetic here and it's been depressed. Some people advance a needle in plane. I don't because one, it's often so steep I can't see my needle anyway, limiting the value of the in plane technique. And two, in some patients, the angle and spacing of the bony structures makes it quite challenging to get between them to access the PV space. Rather than struggle with trying to line up my needle in plane, I go out of plane. Now, as I watch for the tissue distortion to give me a hint of my needle location, I also make liberal use of saline as I advance, starting about halfway to the pleura. I'll inject a small squirt of saline and watch for the small expansion on the screen as a surrogate marker for my needle tip. There we go. Now I'll advance another couple of millimeters and give another squirt. 
As I get closer to the costa transverse ligament, I'll make my movement smaller, and then on one of my squirts, the pleura will be seen pushing away, meaning that I've passed through the ligament and I'm in the PV space. I'll then switch to local anesthetic and complete the block at that level. As we now know, the paravertebral and space posterior to the ligament have communicating passages. This means that we don't necessarily have to be precisely in the PV space to get local next to the intercostal nerve. The midpoint of the transverse process and pleura block, or MTP block, leverages this by deliberately placing local anesthetic posterior to the ligament with very good effect. In my hands, when I'm after surgical anesthesia for mastectomy, I do attempt to put the local in each paravertebral space. But it's nice to know that if I can't see the pleura all that well in some patients, the MTP block will ensure some local gets to the nerve. In this clip, we can clearly see the pleura being pushed down, indicating that we're in the paravertebral space. Near the end of the 5 mil injection, we can also see the ventral erector spinae muscle bowing upwards, nicely showing that there is flow between the two compartments. Here it is sped up for clarity. PVB results in dense blockade of the thorax or abdomen, and like epidural analgesia, you can place the block at specific levels to get specific effects. We'll commonly perform PVBs for breast cases, thoracic surgery, upper abdominal incisions, open nephrectomy, as well as analgesia for rib fractures. We put catheters in using the same technique. Once the pleura is depressed, the catheter is gently advanced a few centimeters into the paravertebral space. Here's the pro position with the needle being advanced from out of plane. Okay, so here's a block in real time. We see some tissue deformation over the centered interspace. As a needle approaches the costal transverse ligament, we give some small puffs of saline. On one of the puffs, we see the pleura sink down. Mm. We finish administering all five mils and then remove the needle. At the next interspace, we repeat the process. Here comes the needle out of plane, through erector spinae, little puff of saline there, a little farther, and there's the pleura. Although PVBs can look intimidating, the saline method ensures that you know where your needle tip is and it becomes a very safe technique. Knowing the levels you need to anesthetize is important. Breast surgery is our biggest use case and for that we need to get T2 through T6. Note that T1 is mostly a brachial plexus route and there's minimal, if any, contribution to chest wall sensation. Okay, so given our plan, we can do this one of several ways. If I'm after surgical anesthesia with let's have a conversation while you're having your mastectomy type blockade, I do every level, T2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and I'll put 4 or 5 mils in each. If I'm after just post-operative analgesia and I don't need 100.0% blockade of the chest wall, I'll do either two injections of 12.5 mils at T3 and T5, or one single injection of 25 mils at T4, counting on some spread up and down. You'll want your local anesthetic to be fairly concentrated. Half percent ropivacaine or something similar is a good choice. And here's some paravertebral tips. First, don't guess at the level. Be precise. Use your ultrasound to scan up the rib cage until you find the first rib, and you'll know it's the first rib because you can't see any more, and then travel back down until your target. Remember that the thoracic intercostal nerves emerge below the corresponding rib. In other words, the T2 nerve runs in the T2-3 interspace. Second, I'm quick to grab the curvilinear probe if the patient is heavy. There's no joy in fighting at 5 to 6 centimeters trying to guess where the pleura might be. The curve probe gives me a nice picture, and as you can see here, the technique and image look very similar. If you're placing a catheter, don't thread it in too far. It's easy for the catheter tip to end up jammed up in the intercostal space or even the epidural space, so limit the amount of catheter advanced to three to four centimeters max. And finally, remember that if and when you do get a questionable picture, depositing local anesthetic in the space just superficial to the costal transverse ligament is fair game. And while you might not get surgical grade anesthesia with this MTP approach, you'll get very good analgesia.